Good afternoon, Governor. Good to be with you. Thank you, John. Look Appreciate forward. your doing. Now, I'm happy to talk about you know issues involving our country and how we fix some of those issues. You know, and there's been so much talk about dysfunction and gridlock in Washington that government not serving the interests of the people. What do you see about the issues in Washington? Why do we have such dysfunction in our federal government? You know, it's really tragic. Uh, this is the greatest country ever, the United States, and our potential is unlimited, except we have a horrible dysfunctional government in Washington. And ultimately, as you know from our time running the state of New York, it comes down to executive leadership. Yes, there's uh, uh, difficulty negotiating with Congress in this case, but that's what an executive has to do. If you have to lay out your priorities, understand your agenda, but then sit down and negotiate and talk and realize that you're not going to get 100% your way all the time. Uh, we had a very recalcitrant legislature. When I wanted to reduce the size of the government, cut taxes by over $140 billion, the legislature didn't go along with it, but you sat down, you worked through it, you negotiated, you made people sometimes do things that they they had doubts about, but ultimately, when you provide that executive leadership, you, pr you advance the agenda, find common ground with the legislature, uh, in this case Congress, and then ultimately work in the interest of the public. And it's not happening in Washington, and you can point fingers here or there, but ultimately, the president is the president, just as the governor is the governor. And either you get the job done, or, or you try something different. You know, Governor, you're um, you know talking about leadership and the way you asserted leadership in in Albany. Can you tell us a little bit about how you personally asserted leadership, got things done when you were facing in you know a uh, very difficult legislature to say the least, yes. and trying to move your agenda forward? How were you successful in getting some of your major initiatives done? You know, uh, there's no single pattern. Uh, it comes down to understanding who you're negotiating with, understanding what their needs are and trying to find a way to, to reach middle ground. Uh, and like our first year, uh, we had a multiple $5 billion deficit, highest tax burden, lowest credit rating, and yet I wanted to cut taxes. Uh, and the legislature just thought it couldn't be done. But I made the case. I won the election. I'm the governor of this state. Give me the opportunity to try. Uh, and ultimately, the legislature very reluctantly passed our multi-year tax cut program. And I remember the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on the, on the floor of the, uh, of the state assembly saying, this is a horrible idea. I don't agree with it. We'll be back next year undoing it. But he voted yes, and next year they understood that the policy worked. So, so you just have to find whatever it takes when you believe in an agenda, including compromising, uh, to, to reach that common ground and to get your agenda moving forward. You have the dysfunction and the gridlock in, in, in Washington. What do you see of specifically some of the really challenges that our government faces in, in, in Washington, and how do we meet those big challenges of a federal government face. Go, uh, quite simply, Washington and the government is too big, too powerful, too expensive, too intrusive, and we talk about companies being too big to fail. Washington is too big to succeed. Uh, there are three basic elements of what Washington, in my mind, has to do. Provide for the security of its people. We're not doing that. You cannot say we are a secure country when hundreds of thousands of people cross the borders and we don't know who they are. We need to secure the border. We cannot say we're a safe, safe country when ISIS is out recruiting Americans through the Internet and social media. And Al-Qaeda is training people who launched those attacks in Paris and want to launch attacks here. We have to be proactive. We should have learned from September 11th that you cannot sit back and hope that they don't attack you again when they have training camps where they recruit, train, organize, plan, and prepare to attack us again. We have got to attack them there. We don't have to nation build. We shouldn't nation build, send a massive army or spend a trillion dollars to create a democracy where it's never existed. But we do have to be proactive to attack those who would attack us here before they have that chance. Uh, so immigration, security. The second thing government does is provide the right economic climate where the private sector, small businesses, large companies can grow and create jobs. And we need many, many millions more jobs, particularly better paying jobs for middle class workers. And yet we have a tax law that is incomprehensible, written by lobbyists and fixers for interest groups. Do you know how long the, the U.S. tax code with all its regulations is? You know, you think the tax code is like this. 
74,000 pages of incomprehensible, special interest driven gobbledygook. And if you're rich and powerful, you benefit from a tax credit or a loophole or an exemption or a break. If you're an ordinary citizen, or if you're a small business person trying to add that eighth or ninth job and grow the economy, you don't get any special breaks. So we have to not just simplify and dramatically lower that horribly convoluted and expensive tax code, but we also have to end the hold that lobbyists and special interests have in Washington. Uh, and we need to dramatically reform it. It's not simply a question of tinkering around the edges. We need to take Washington back. It is a government now that is out of touch with the people, doesn't act in the people's interest, tries to dictate so many elements of what we have to do with our lives, when the whole concept of government is that we, the people, tell the government and the politicians what they should do instead of them telling us what we must do. Well, you know, Governor, certainly I was with you on September 11th, and your leadership, not only on that day, but is taking steps to protect New Yorkers after yeah. that, securing the new, you know, the Canadian border, which was a big initiative you had, make sure that the state police were fully staffed, putting them on the MTA trains when we were when necessary. I mean, you really did an outstanding job, as you always said, protecting the safety of New Yorkers was your first priority. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, we talk a little bit about the economics. You faced real economic challenges when you took over as governor in, in 1995. How do you translate that to some of the challenges that the federal government is now facing on the economic front? I, I think it's very similar. Uh, if you're a small business person or a medium-sized corporation today, the biggest impediment to growing your business is not the economic climate, it's Washington. Uh, if you grow from uh, a certain number of employees, you have to p pay a $3,000 per employee penalty under Obamacare uh, because it's such an intrusive uh, anti-job law. Uh, if you have employees working 40 hours a week, but you reduce them to 29 hours a week, that $3,000 penalty uh, per year, per employee, goes away. We have to get rid of these provisions. We have to get rid of the over-regulation. There are so many regulations imposed on businesses that the cost of complying with them prevents people from going out and adding that next employee. And we did that. We created the Office of Regulatory Reform to revise and repeal literally thousands of job-killing regulations. We have to empower people, particularly the small businesses and the entrepreneurs, with an economic climate where they want to grow here. Lower the tax burden, lower the regulatory burden, stop imposing costs like Obamacare does on every single employer uh, in this country, uh, and put in place those pro-growth economic policies. What should be done to address the dysfunction, the problems that uh, our nation is facing with our government in Washington? Well, we also have to reform the way the government functions. Uh, as I said, with the tax code, it's just ridiculous to be 74,000 pages of lobbyist-driven special interest loopholes and exemptions. Uh, so we have to change that. Uh, right now, over 400 former members of the House and Senate are registered lobbyists in Washington. Uh, this is not right, where someone from any part of the country gets elected, and within six months they know they play the game, they can stay in Washington forever, and after they're out, whether they lose or don't run again, make ten times what they do going home by peddling influence in Washington. That's got to stop. So I would propose a law permanently banning anybody who served one day in Congress from ever serving as a lobbyist in Washington. I would pass a law saying lobbyists can't contribute to political campaigns. I would pass a law requiring term limits for uh, uh, people who go, go to Congress and Senate. The conce concept wasn't to have a permanent political class. It was American citizens would take a time out of their lives to do public service. And now we have a what is essentially a permanent political class in Washington. And by the way, for the last six years, the Senate never passed a budget. You remember we had that problem when I was governor that the legislature would not pass a budget. We finally changed the law so that if the legislature didn't pass the budget on the due date, they didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. We should do the same thing in Washington. You don't pass the budget in Washington by the due date, which I believe is October 1, the beginning of their fiscal year. You don't get paid until that budget is adopted. You know, anybody who, who lives in this country knows you don't do your job, you're not going to get paid, right. except in Washington. So I think these are some of the reforms that would give power back to the people because those elected by the people would understand that they're accountable to them and not to the interest groups in Washington. Great. You know, Governor, for those, that person that is uh, struggling with a, you know, a family, they may be losing a job, what's the message that 
our government should be sending to them? Is it, you know, another free program? Yeah. Or what's the message of hope that we have for these, for these individuals, these families, about why we're going to make their lives better? Uh, you just hit it right on the head. It's uh, the Washington current thing is, you know, if you're a struggling middle class family, maybe making forty-eight thousand dollars a year and living paycheck to paycheck, Washington will look and say, oh poor person, we got to help you and we'll give you this program or we'll give you that program. But the money comes from that worker. We borrow it from China and that worker's taxes go to repay what the government tells you is free. So, And what it does in the meantime is it imposes a cost on your employer. So instead of giving you a raise or hiring your neighbor or letting your kid have a job at the same plant, uh, they're too busy paying off the bills and the cost of compliance in Washington. So we have to grow the economy. We have to create more jobs. We have to empower, in my view, particularly manufacturers with the dramatic lowering of energy costs in this country and the dramatic increase in labor costs around the globe like in China, we should be a manufacturing powerhouse where we have hundreds of thousands of new blue collar jobs that pay well. Uh, I'll just give you one example. What we did in the capital region of New York State mm -hmm. where we created this center of excellence in nano uh, science. Right now we have over $20 billion in upstate New York in private sector investment in factories competing with in the global economy because of the programs we put in place. And I toured the most recent chip manufacturing plant, a $3 billion plant, and talked to the workers on the floor. And the carpenters, the steam fitters, the electricians, the welders, they're all making between eighty dollars and $120,000 a year. Very good paying jobs. We should have millions more of those jobs in the United States. And if we had the right economic climate coming from Washington, we would. Yeah, you should be very proud of that. that a nano facility, if someone back in 95 said New, New York State is going to be the capital or the center for nano development, I think they would have probably... In the globe. In the globe. In and the it globe. has become because of your vision there, Governor. Yeah. So what's the one thing on the economy that the federal government should be doing that it's not doing right now? Well, I think, first of all, throwing out the tax code and lowering the rates and ending the regulatory burden. But there is one role that government does play, and that's infrastructure. Uh, and we had this so-called trillion-dollar infrastructure shovel-ready program, and I'm told that less than nine billion of the trillion dollars actually went to infrastructure programs. But we do need to improve our highways and bridges and transit, and we can do it uh, through private sector investment partnered with state and other governments. But uh, the, the impediments to this, too, are just enormous. So we see costs much higher than they should be. Uh, the environmental regulatory process, where you can have a great idea for a project, but it's going to take you three years at best to try to get it through the environmental uh, planning process. We need to expedite it. Yes, we need to protect the environment and make sure that things are done in a sound environmental way. But it doesn't have to take three years and millions of dollars. It should be uh, streamlined, simplified, and, and the government should say that we will make a decision with X period of time. So, so there's so much that can be done that isn't being done. And in the process, uh, you know, our, our middle class families are hurting. You know, and you always hear, oh, it's about the middle class, it's about the middle class. The president in the State of the Union said, you know, we're growing at 5%. No, we're not. We're growing year over year at closer to 2%. And we should be growing at 5%. And if the government would put in place the policies to empower the small businesses and the private sector to grow, then we could grow at 5%. And then everybody would have a better economic outlook. You know, you mentioned this whole the state of this uh, state of the state state of the union address last night, and it's all about so-called income equality. Um, what do you see about the role of, as far as the government trying to achieve whatever income <laughs> equality or inequality <laughs> is actually supposed to mean? You know, uh, one of the sad things about the Obama administration is it it always seeks to divide people. You know, oh, it's this group, it's the one percent, or it's the this group, or it's that group, uh, and paint victims who need entitlements, and the entitlements are just uh, uh, just so uh, overblown in this country now. We have to rein those, and as we had to do in New York yeah. when I took office as well, restructure and reduce uh, the entitlement programs and replace them with opportunity. Um, but uh, the, if you look at income inequality, first of all, uh, we need to put in place policies to strengthen the family. 
You know, when a child is born to a one-parent family, as hard and as hardworking and conscientious as that one parent is, the odds are five times greater that that child will grow up in, in poverty. And yet we have penalties if you get married on the, under the tax code. We have a child credit that is so small it doesn't come close to reflecting what, uh, uh, what the cost of raising a child is. And by the way, if a couple gets married and they're getting health care under Obamacare subsidized, they lose the subsidies. Yeah. So we create all these government incentives not to get married. And the tragedy is that, as I said, a child born and raised in a one family, one parent family, is five times more likely to grow up in poverty. The second thing, as we all know, the key to my having the opportunity to, to be uh, able to lead this great state of New York and, uh, is a great education. I went to public schools uh, all through, uh, through high school, and we had good public schools. Right now, too many Americans, particularly low-income, inner-city minority kids, are going to schools that we know fail that can't teach them year after year. And yet Obama and his colleagues protect those failing schools because of the power of the teachers unions and the education bureaucracy. We have to reform education in a way that empowers parents with the opportunity to see that their child has a choice to go to a school that can actually teach them. So you look at income inequality. We want to strengthen the family unit. We want to improve schools so that we don't send children to failing schools. And then the third leg of the school are the jobs. Uh, and, and if we changed Washington so that we created an economic climate where people wanted to grow and invest in the United States, then I believe that is the way to end in income inequality. You know, one of the unique things about America is you look at Europe and they had a feudal system. And when that feudal system ended, people have been trapped at the bottom and in poverty, not just for generations, but for centuries. And that was the expectation. In the United States, we never had a permanent class that was low income or poor. We believed everybody had the opportunity through work and diligence to achieve whatever their dream was. That's the dream we have to recreate in every American family's mind. That's the dream that they can achieve what their, their goals are through hard work and sacrifice. And yes, we have to have good schools. Yes, we have to have strong families and government policies that encourage those. And then ultimately, we will have those jobs. Well, spoken like a true grandson of, uh, of immigrants. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and yes. you know, you talked about uh, you know, education and certainly one of your big victories was getting charter schools in New York State long before there was real discussion of charter schools and making sure that children had an educational choice. I think it's a great legacy that you have here in New York. Oh, thank you. Having shepherded that through. Yeah, that was, a, that was, a, a, that was, that was another law that was very difficult and we needed to use every lever possible to get the legislature to pass a very good charter school uh, bill. But States are the laboratories of democracy. Yeah. And what I wanted to do in New York was to create competition within the public system. We did it with charter schools and have accountability. If a parent doesn't know if their school is succeeding or not, they don't have the power to do something about it. So we put in place school report cards as well. We sh we, I would have liked to have done far more. Uh, and uh, both New York and the federal government need to do for, far more to empower parents with the opportunity to know their child is going to have the, the chance for a good education. Uh, and hopefully that day will come. Well, Governor, thank you for chatting with me this afternoon. It's been John, great. Thank you for all you did to help me well, change the direction of the state of New honor. York. And, and thank you for after September 11th heading up our effort uh, right. to make sure that uh, Lower Manhattan and Ground Zero came back stronger awesome. and yet at the same time we have the memorial and the museum and so millions of people who weren't born on September 11th will appreciate uh, the magnitude of the horror and the strength with which we responded wow. and that's a tribute to well, you, John. Well, it's a tribute to your vision, Governor. We're all proud to have been part of that. It's a special place. Thank you.